Is your debt causing you sleepless nights? Knock your debt out with Debt KO. And your debt won't be the only thing keeping you up at night. Debt KO, free impartial advice on all your debt. for IFL TV in association with MTK Global with me this evening I've got with me known as the boxing guy as Conor McGregor said Mr. Dan Raphael Dan how are we I'm doing great thanks for having me on you know I'm a big uh, a big IFL guy love it love what okay. you guys do we know you are how, firstly how are you how's the family how's your close friends with everything that's going on around yeah. the world at the moment same as uh, it ever was, just uh, not as much activity, not as much travel, not as much stuff going on. But, you know, like most people, just uh, happy to be here. So far, so good. Dan, I mentioned, obviously, um, the boxing guy, Conor McGregor. I remember seeing you at the Conlon fight and you say, yo, you're that boxing guy. You're, you're known to be an industry legend. Um, <laughs> Thank you. How have things been for you personally? Because, like you said, you're normally traveling week in, week out, covering fights, writing reports, which I know you are now with on your own Facebook and with boxing scene, but has it affected you personally? Well, I mean, it has, I guess, in one degree, because, I mean, tell you the truth, this is really, uh, as we record this, we're coming up on the first weekend where I'm kind of antsy and, like, itchy, like, I wish I was going to be at the fight. There obviously have been a number of fights that have taken place since boxing came back in June. And there's been some good fights, the Charlo card. You know, there was obviously, uh, you know, several other fights that have taken place in America that were interesting fights. But the one on Saturday between uh, Vasily Lomachenko and Tiafimo Lopez, that's a bona fide big time fight. And um, I'm not going to be there. And it's, it's, it's disappointing. And I would be looking forward to it. But to be honest, I'm not really thrilled or, in, you know, have the desire to travel with what's going on uh, with the virus. It's, it's getting worse here once again in the United States. Uh, so I wasn't like necessarily in, into getting on an airplane and sitting there for five and a half hours to get to Las Vegas. And also, let's be honest, I mean, ever since I've left ESPN, even though I'm still uh, working and, and, and making some money and, and being involved and, and all that kind of stuff with my uh, reporting and stories and, and commentaries for The Ring magazine and for Boxing Scene, you know, at the moment, no one's paying my way to go to the event. So you know what, I'm going to kick back and I'm going to watch the fight. I'm going to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, after the fact, you know, uh, you know, have my say in what happened. But uh, I'm okay right now. I mean, I'd like to get back on the road at some point, but more so, not so much about, um, you know, what outlet I'm working for, but that it's safe for, for all of us to travel again, to go to the events. That's what I'm looking forward to. Because even once you get there, it's a lot different. You're getting tested. You can't have uh, the same kind of good times that you would have because there's so much separation with people. You're you know, probably spending most of your time in your room. So it's, uh, it's not like it was. I, I do, that's one thing I do miss about the travel is not just the activity and the excitement of the event and the coverage and the, and the, and the work, but uh, the social aspects of it, like seeing you know, your, your friends in the business who you haven't seen for a long time and, and getting together and you know, getting a drink or having a bite or just you know, uh, kicking back and having a good conversation about the fights you know, in the media center or just you know, at, the, at the lounge that night. So I miss that part of it, but you know, I'm okay being at home for the time being. Dan, some big uh, news broke this week uh, regarding Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. We were all hoping to see that trilogy fight in July got postponed. They said around October, pandemic. Then, then they said December the 19th. Um, conflicting stories at the moment. We've had Bob Arum and Frank Warren both say that um, Deontay doesn't want it. The time has expired on the contract. Um, we're moving on. We're going to fight in December. Shelley has come out, as, but has said that no, the fight will happen and it will go ahead. So who's right, who's wrong? And was there a stipulation in the contract to say there is a time frame? And considering the pandemic, do they have a, a, a kind of right? Well, certainly I don't have a copy of the contract. And if anybody out there has it, by all means, send it to me. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, though, yeah, I'm sure that somewhere in the paperwork, there was a time frame stipulated. Because keep in mind, this was a two-way contract. This was a contract that whoever was the winner of the second fight that took place in February, the loser was going to have the option to pick up uh, the, the rematch clause. And they would both be bound by those same terms. And that was the split of the money as well as any times that were deadlines for when these things had to take place. Now, pandemic or not, you know, a, a deadline to do a rematch, you know, I'm sure was there. But again, it probably doesn't last in perpetuity. At some point, there's got to be some kind of cutoff date. And I know from both sides, before the second fight, it was an earlier deadline because they wanted to 
do it as quickly as possible because they knew that if they could take care of that obligation, that there would be other big business down the road against Joshua or whatever other big fight that there was. Uh, so I, I suspect that there probably was a deadline, whether they can argue that the pandemic, you know, should, should pause the deadline or extend the deadline. That's up to a, you know, either a, a judge or, or, you know, a negotiation or a mediator or something like that to decide. Uh, and I'll say this, you know, look, Shelly Finkel is Deontay's longtime career long manager. I've known Shelly for more than 20 years and have dealt with him on any number of fights and fighters over the years. And uh, always had a pretty good relationship with Shelly. He's been very forthright with me on a lot of stories. But I'll say this, the manager of the fighter who seeks this third fight he, can, he can't unilaterally say there's going to be a fight because they, he can't and Deontay can't and Al Heyman, the other co-manager and the team behind Deontay, can't make Tyson Fury show up in the boxing ring uh, you know, or make them engage in continuing negotiations to get this date worked out. So if Bob Arum and Frank Warren and Tyson Fury and the people at MTK say, no, we're not doing the third fight, you know, Deontay and Shelly can jump up and down and, you know, and, yell from the rooftops but that doesn't mean there's going to be a third fight so if if the, the fury side says we're not doing the third fight i'm taking them at their word that they're looking to move on unless something dramatic happens and and the wilder camp makes it truly worth their while to revisit it was it quite coincidence because coincidental because only two weeks ago it was announced that mark breeland would be no longer part of team wilder and then two weeks later we almost say this fight's completely off do you think it, there's any kind of does it go together I don't think they have really anything to do with each other. Uh, you know, I broke that story about Breland uh, no longer being part of uh, Team Wilder. That was from a conversation that I had with Shelley Finkel. We didn't really want to get into the particulars about it, but basically that was the decision that the team made. And Deontay was going to not, not radically change his corner. It wasn't a situation like when Tyson Fury parted ways with Ben Davison after the second fight and then went and uh, started training with uh, Sugar Hill Stewart. This was more Deontay... Uh, is still obviously upset that Mark Breland threw in the towel uh, in the in the rematch against Tyson Fury and was going to go with JDs, who has been his longtime career, long trainer since he was an amateur, really. And and Malik Scott, uh, the former heavyweight contender who Deontay has been uh, friends with for a number of years, uh, was going to take on added responsibility in the camp. They weren't bringing in an entirely new person. So I don't think the uh, the fact that Fury has decided not to do the fight because he didn't like the timing. He didn't want to pu push it into next year. I don't really think the two have much to do with each other, to tell you the truth. I think that uh, Deontay was making changes and probably would have done this whether the Fury fight was going to take place or not. Dan, so if, if Waller doesn't get this trilogy fight, where does he go? Because a lot of the heavyweights are with Matchroom, top rank. Al doesn't have a lot of heavyweight. Michael Hunt is a free agent. Andy Ruiz, a few others. But surely Wilder... Is, is there for the mega fights. He is, but I think that if there is not going to be a Tyson Fury third fight next, there's nothing wrong with him coming back, getting used to the new corner, taking another fight against, you know, not a, a total nobody, but, you know, some sort of reputable heavyweight, but not at the, you know, I mean, not Joshua, not Fury. Uh, and there are other heavyweights that, that fight under the PBC banner that theoretically could be made. You mentioned a couple, whether it's an Andy Ruiz or, or, or somebody along those lines. Um, so I think they're going to have to figure that out because obviously if he comes back against somebody that's not a Deontay, uh, not a Tyson Fury, not an Anthony Joshua, the dollars are going to be a lot less to fight uh, the kind of fights that are going to be available to him than, you know, the 20, 25, maybe more millions of dollars to fight uh, the bigger name. So he's going to have to adjust his economic uh, expectations in any fight if you're not fighting Tyson Fury or Anthony Joshua. But look, Deontay Wilder has been, uh, a guy that's not uh, ducked opponents. He's fought some very good opponents over the last few years. He's made a tremendous amount of money, and he just has to get his mind right, get back in the gym, come back. And you know what? Every, every fighter that stubs their toe uh, sometimes has to take a little bit of a step back. Not everybody, but sometimes. And you know what? If Deontay Wilder comes back, wins a fight against you know somebody, I have no doubt that it won't take uh, another fight before he's back into a big fight. Now, because you have a situation where Fury and Joshua seem to be on this collision course, the belts probably won't be available to him, but it doesn't mean he can't fight fights that fans are interested in or, or that will be entertaining for us to watch. With Usyk Chisora, end of this month, uh, White Povetkin, Dubois, uh, Joyce, Parker Farr, AJ Pulev, a lot of the heavyweights are not available for Tyson Fury to fight. So I know people like Lucas Brown, Otto Wallin have said, give me the fight, give me the fight, but do we expect him to go in kind of a low-level fight 
been out for eight, nine months now before that anti Joshua fight next, next year? I don't think it's going to be like super low level. Uh, you know, the WBC's rules are pretty clear. You have to fight if you're going to, def he's going to defend the title. It's going to have to be somebody in their top 15. Now you can look at the top 15 now. And as I was discussing with somebody on uh, Twitter the other day, just because that name, whoever he ends up fighting may not necessarily be in the top 15 at the moment, because what promoters do is they come up with who they want him to fight and they make the case of the organization. They end up getting him ranked in the top 15 between now and whenever the fight would take place. But if you look at the top 15 as it exists today, um, one of the names that I was told was, again, not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly on the short list as a possibility, and it made a lot of sense to me, was uh, the German undefeated former European champion, Agit Cabello. Uh, he is also co-promoted by Top Rank as is Fury, so from that promotional point of view, it's probably not too complicated to make. He won't face any uh, you know, extremely difficult travel restrictions because of the virus. He's in, in Europe already, uh, being that he fights out of Germany. Uh, he has a good record. He's 20-0. and 0. He is uh, experienced. He has, you know, he has a win against Chisora, so he, you know, he's got at least a reputable uh, resume in that respect. And, but he's also probably not a guy that the Fury camp fears in a sense. Like they, they, you know, it's a it's a credible fight, but he's not too tough of opponent probably in at least in my mind and probably the minds of the people that actually have to make those decisions. So that's the kind of guy that I would look for. Not a mega fight, but not a not a not a bum fight either. I mean, you know, a credible. A uh, reputable fight, you know. Certainly, if you know he would stack up with some of the guys who were challengers that fought against Joshua when he was, you know, uh, defending the title, or when Wilder was defending the title. Uh, you know, again, mega fight, no, but credible. And if Tyson Fury's in the boxing ring, you know, I'm going to watch whoever he's fighting. You mentioned there that if the collision course does take place with Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury, all the belts may not be on the line. But obviously, looking at the WBO belt, where Usyk is the mandatory. Now, we just saw recently with Josh Taylor and Ramirez, Jack Cattrall stepped aside, probably took something financially and guaranteed to fight the winner. Could we see that with Usyk? Because Usyk's team are actually saying that we are not going to step aside, we want the fight. But if you throw money at him and guarantee that you will fight the winner, do you think he'll step aside? I, I suspect that he would. I mean, number one, he's got to win the fight uh, at the end of the month against Chisora, which he's the favorite. But again, you know, Derek Chisora has never made it an easy night for anybody, uh, you know, whether he was fighting a top championship level fight like when he against Klitschko or any of the other, you know, quality guys that he has faced through the years, you know, he is the ultimate litmus test. So uh, uh, Usyk has only had one previous fight as a heavyweight against Chaz Witherspoon, who is a, a credible professional, but he's not even on the same level as Chisora. So first things first, he's got to win the fight. Once that happens, if that happens, you know, then they'll have to have a conversation. You know, Joshua's going to have to take care of his business against uh, Kubrat Pulev. But I, I suspect that with the right situation, uh, that they will be able to work something out for Usyk to stand aside, let the big undisputed fight happen. Obviously, they both have uh, relations with Matchroom Boxing. Uh, Usyk is co-promoted there, so Eddie Hearn, you know, is involved in, in any fight that Usyk is going to do. And uh, I know I suspect, and again, knowing Usyk's uh, manager, uh, Agus Klimas, as well as Eddie, and Usyk himself, who, you know, is a competitive guy, but, you know, I think they could convince him, like, you might get a chance to fight for the title for all four titles at the same time, you know, you know, and by the way, continue to get better as anyway and make a whole lot more money if you do that, you know, because they probably have to pay a little bit to, uh, or a lot to get them to stand down. Um, it seems, it seems like a reasonable situation. I think the whole world uh, wants to see the undisputed fight between Fury and Joshua and, uh, you know, Usyk, uh, I don't think is going to necessarily stand in the way of that happening. I certainly hope not. Let me ask a controversial question. This Saturday night, Teofimo Lopez and Lomachenko, is this an undisputed clash? Okay. The definition of undisputed is you have all four of the title belts. So by that definition, it's not. Because they can say whatever they want, but a franchise title is not the world title. Period. I mean, they announced it when they created the thing. You know, whatever. They gave the, the, the if you look, the WBC World Lightweight Champion. And this is not a matter of my opinion. This is what they say. The, the lightweight champion of the WBC is Devin Haney. So therefore, this fight is not for the undisputed title. However, that, there's a difference. The guy that wins between Lomachenko and Lopez is clearly the number one lightweight in the world. That's not even up for debate. He's going to be the unified world champion. And certainly in the case of Lomachenko, he'll have made the case that he still, many people view him as number one pound for pound. Uh, you know, he would, you know, put another uh, big check box, you know, check mark in that box uh, on that uh, part of his resume. But, you know, Personally, I'm not going to re re refer to this as the undisputed lightweight champion because 
the definition is you need the four belts, not the franchise belt, the actual world title. So, you know, you want to get technical from my perspective, and I'm not biased against it. I mean, I love the fight. I can't wait to watch the fight. Uh, they're both tremendous talents, uh, you know, Lomachenko and, and, and Lopez. I've covered many of their fights. I like both those guys personally. But, uh, you know, I'm not calling it the undisputed title. And only in boxing can they screw things up so bad that this would even be a thing that we have to talk about. You know, somebody should talk to Devin Haney about that, or they should have not given him the title the way they did and just, you know, insisted on certain things. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. There's, you know, it's bad enough with what the WBA does. I'm not putting up with that shit from the WBC. I spoke to Mauricio Suleiman a number of weeks ago, and he said the franchise is given to a certain fighter who has reached a certain status. Which you, and we know Loma has been there and achieved three weight, three weight world champion, beating great fighters. So, does Lopez, if he wins, become the franchise champion? Well, Mauricio, I, I you know, and look, I've, I, I like Mauricio. We're friendly. We, we're in contact all the time. I enjoy his company. We've spent many times together talking about these things having a meal together, that sort of stuff. I, I enjoy his company. I respect him. I think, you know, and I to, I've told him this to his face. For the most part, you know, I think he's done an excellent job since he had to step into his father's footsteps and run the organization after his father passed. Uh, you know, he's been around boxing his entire life. He has a true love of the sport. I like Mauricio. But we also argue and, and debate and discuss and disagree on this stuff. But just because you disagree with somebody doesn't mean you can't you know, like them or, or respect them or enjoy their company. On this particular issue, we've had a number of uh, debates and conversation at varying uh, levels of uh, irritation. Um, but when they announced the creation of it, again, they did it, it was meant as like, almost like a trophy belt. You could, it was actually said, I believe in the original press announcement when they declared that Canelo Alvarez was their first franchise champion, that it was non-transferable. You could not win it in the ring. That if you had the franchise title and you lost, you know, you didn't necessarily uh, lose it, and it didn't necessarily go to the guy who beat you in the ring. Now they, and then the same thing happened when they gave um, that franchise title to Lomachenko when they were trying to. I won't say they weren't ducking Devin Haney, but they didn't want to fight that mandatory because they felt like the Lopez fight was a much bigger fight and a fight that was much easier to make from the network perspective. And and Lopez, uh, again, all due respect to Devin Haney, was a fantastic young talent. Uh, Lopez has got more. Uh, name recognition is, is a bigger deal so far because he's, you know, frankly been fighting on TV in America and at a higher level of cards for the last, you know, a little bit longer than Haney has been, you know, so they just, they took that franchise title. Now, suddenly in the last, you know, week or two, Mauricio, and again, I was on a, a media uh, Zoom call with him and several of the other reporters uh, earlier this week where we were talking about this exact issue. And he made the point that that if Lomachenko loses in this fight, that Lopez would get the franchise title. So in essence, they're saying it is transferable. They're almost making it like what happens with the WBA with their silly super titles and regular titles. Um, you know, you can't have it both ways also. So while it would be a fantastic victory for, for uh, Tiafimo Lopez, and he'll stamp himself clearly as the number one lightweight in the world, still be undefeated and, and, and have beaten, you know, a, a probable future Hall of Famer in Lomachenko, uh, the reason that they gave Loma and Canelo the franchise titles was because of what they already accomplished, not by beating a certain guy to get an accomplishment. So Lopez, in my mind, based on that criteria, hadn't qualified yet because he hadn't fought anybody other than like, you know, a nice win against Richard Colme. Whereas Loma's had a series of, you know, significant victories against a lot of quality opponents in multiple weight classes. Same thing goes for Canelo. So, you know, they'd like to change their rules as they go. And again, I can't say this more strongly, I like and respect Mauricio. I think the WBC under his uh, uh, leadership has done a hell of a job for the most part. In this particular situation, I could not more disagree with what they're doing. Dan, a lot of the, the top fighters have either fought or are going to be fighting in a couple of months. I know Triple G's yet to make an announcement. I believe Crawford Brooks going to be done November 14th. Errol Spence is back. Even Mike Tyson's back and Roy Jones Jr. But we yeah. haven't heard anything from Canelo. We know he's got this ongoing case with Golden Boy and Gazon. Um, is there an update? Is, is there news on what's going to happen? Are they going to resolve this outside of court? I mean, they're still talking from what my sources tell me about, you know, trying to work something out. Uh, you know, Gazon had made an offer to basically renegotiate his contract, which, you know, was going to be a significant drop in money. But, uh, you know, from Canelo's point of view, I guess they would have to at least consider it because you'd still be making a substantial amount of money and you wouldn't be on ice for, you know, a lengthy period of time where, you're not fighting and, you know, not, not 
making money, not giving fans what they want to see, not increasing your legacy and, you know, getting rusty as the days and weeks, the months and years go on. So I think they're still in that situation, you know, on the legal side of things, there's been some back and forth and some uh, sort of, you know, very uh, legalese, uh, you know, sort of inside baseball, like we'd say in America, it's sort of like not, you know, very hardcore minutia of this, like in terms of trying to dis debate for different legal uh, reasons, where the lawsuit should be, should it be in the federal court system, should it be in the state court system, they've, they've gone back and forth, you know, one side files uh, a motion to do one thing, the other side wants to do something else. So at this moment, they haven't even figured out specifically 100%, is it going to be in a federal court or is it going to be in a state court? So there's, there's a lot of that stuff going on that has nothing whatsoever to do with whether you or I or anybody else gets to watch Canelo Alvarez, you know, for my money, the best pound for pound fighter in boxing, get in the boxing ring and fight, you know, a, a top level opponent. Um, I say this, you know, here we are in the middle of October and, you know, unless something dramatic happens and I don't want to be, uh, you know, an ultimate naysayer or a cynic, but I have a hard time seeing unless something very dramatic happens in the coming days, you know, a week, whatever, we are not going to see Canelo Alvarez fight this year, which is just terrible because if you take a look at the schedule that the zone has laid out, you know, a lot of the days have been filled already. Um, I don't know how many more there are to be filled and it certainly gets to a point in December, you know, there are certain dates you're not going to fight. They're not going to go on Christmas week, obviously, because then nobody's going to be paying attention. They're certainly not going to spend, you know, gargantuan amounts of money to put on a fight that won't get any press attention or, or fan or public attention because of the holiday. Um, so they're in a tough spot. You know, I think that we're probably going to go the rest of the year and unfortunately not going to see Canelo in the, in the ring, which is, which really sucks when you think about it, because here's a guy who's one of the great fighters in modern times. Um, you know, again, m myself and many others view him as the pound for pound number one. And in 2019, uh, he was the fighter of the year from a lot of people with, with two very significant wins, a, a, a very nice, uh, very uh, legit victory against Danny Jacobs to unify two of the middleweight titles, then moved up to two weight classes and knocked out Sergey Kovalev, you know, and won a white heavyweight title belt. Kovalev, you know, may not be, might not have been what he was, but he was coming off a big win against, Al against a leader Alvarez to regain that title. And, uh, you know, Kovalev was much bigger than, than Canelo. And Kovalev also was the biggest name in the weight class at that time. And Canelo didn't just beat him. He knocked him out in spectacular fashion. So when you win against Danny Jacobs and unify titles at middleweight, and then you knock out such a big name like Kovalev and win another title, and you get the fighter of the year, and then you follow up in 2020 and you don't even get into the ring. The only thing you do, the only fight you have is with your promoter and your broadcaster. You know, it's, it's, it's bad for the broadcaster. It's bad for his promotional company, Golden Boy. It's bad for Canelo, and it's bad for the fans. Now, let bad me for boxing. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you about, just from an educational perspective, about mandatories. We've seen that Dylan White was a mandatory for the WBC for, for a year or so. Uh, I know they say a thousand days, but he was number one, then became mm -hmm. mandatory. Um, he obviously lost to Povetkin, and everyone assumed that Povetkin would now be the mandatory. Um, now, no, no, no. Um, so Dylan White's done an interview on Sky Sports, and he said that, well, the only thing that's happened is it's, it's just slightly delayed. I'm not, I haven't um, taken six months off. I'm going straight back into the rematch. I'm fighting Povetkin again. When I win, I should be reinstated as mandatory. Marisa Suleiman has come out and said the mandatory will not be called for another year. So how does that mandatory actually work? Is it based on when they decide? Is it based or you have to be number one for a period of time? First of all, everything is based on what they decide. I mean, you can go, and I've done this actually with the organizations. If you read the rule book and you go through all the regulations, there's literally a line like near the end. I don't know, I can't, I don't know the exact wording of it, but I'll paraphrase. It basically says every single thing in here is subject to our, our, uh, our decisions or our board of governors or, you know, that we reserve the right to, to, to update these or change these. So, you know, that can happen with any rule that's on, that's on the books. But generally speaking, and, and I think there's a lot of boxing fans who are confused by this, particularly the WBC makes it more confusing than they need to. And this is another thing that, you know, I've had a few, uh, not, not, I won't say arguments, but just sort of conversations with Mauricio about. In the WBC in particular, just because you appear in their rankings, number one in whatever division it is, that could be the middleweight division, the featherweight division, the heavyweight division, whatever. So just because Dillian White appeared in the number one line, you're the number one contender, does not mean you are the mandatory to the point where the champion is going to be ordered to fight you within a certain time frame. That has to be, um, con you know, they have to say, you're the, they have to announce you're the mandatory. Usually that stuff happens at the convention uh, that comes up once a year, usually in the summertime. Um, 
And in the case of Dillian White, he had ascended to their number one position, had not yet been made the mandatory. At some point, he was made the mandatory. And then he got knocked out by Alexander Povetkin. So you don't retain that position. But just because Povetkin was the guy that did the knockout doesn't mean that he's going to suddenly inherit the, the spot as mandatory. Now, I don't remember what the BC rankings are off the top of my head, but maybe they moved him into the number one position. I think maybe they, they left Wilder at number one in the WBC ratings. But whatever the point is, Povetkin did not become the mandatory. And so if Povetkin and, and White have their rematch and White is the winner, he won't be all of a sudden just put back in as the mandatory because the clock basically started over. Not to mention the fact that the WBC at this point is not going to get in the way of the potential for a Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua fight, which is big for them because of the sanction fees involved, but certainly the prestige of the fight and the, and the worldwide attention on the fight. And they're not going to do that when it makes sense for them to allow Joshua versus Fury for a number of reasons, recognition, fan interest, you know, general public interest and financially. So, you know, Dillian White, unfortunately, did not get a title shot when he was one or mandatory. He took the gamble against Povetkin, pushed the chips into the middle of the table, and he got knocked out and he lost. And I feel bad for him. Um, but uh, if, he, if he wins the fight, he's going to have to, you know, make that case that he should be the mandatory. But nothing is going to stand in the way, at least in terms of the WBC, of uh, they're not going to put a mandatory in position that's going to do anything to possibly, you know, make sideways a deal for Fury to fight against Joshua. So that's just the way it is. But the one thing to remember in the WBC is just because you're number one does not mean you're the mandatory. Absolutely. All right, Dan. Um, so were you planning to watch the, uh, the Lopez Lomachenko fight on Saturday night? On the Where am I going to watch the fight? <laughs> I'm going to watch the fight on my, on my big screen TV, sitting on my couch. I'll be tweeting away with my phone. Um, but I'll be paying close attention. I'll be taking notes because even though I may not be there covering the fight in person or writing a deadline story, off of the fight uh, for any of the websites. I am writing uh, the, uh, the, the post-fight story on that fight, which will be in the Ring Magazine's print edition in the, in the, in the, in the next issue after to cover that. So uh, they tell me it's gonna be the cover story, so I'll be paying attention and I'll be gathering my thoughts and, and material after the fight and, uh, and I'll still be writing about it. And I mean, just as a fan though, putting aside whatever uh, uh, work I'll do in terms of writing a story about it, you know, these are the kind of fights you live for as a boxing fan. We've waited so long to see this. It's been a discussed fight for the last few years, especially with the way Tifima Lopez has been calling out Lomachenko, and now it's finally here, a couple of days away. Uh, the promotion and the buildup has been exciting and been very interesting, despite the fact that there won't be any fans in attendance. And uh, if you're a boxing fan, I have no idea what else you'd be doing on Saturday night other than, you know, with your butt on the couch or on your phone or in your laptop or in your uh, computer, making sure you watch this great fight. Well, we look forward to it and a spectacular event on, on Saturday night. Uh, Dan, I appreciate you get, jumping on and giving me a little bit of your time this evening. Thank you for reading my message on Instagram as well. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't <laughs> no follow problem. me, uh, but you found me, which is good. Uh, but yeah, enjoy the fight and we'll certainly catch up with you soon. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having Dan me on. Thank for IFL TV. Thank you very much. Is your debt causing you sleepless nights? Knock your debt out with Debt KO. And your debt won't be the only thing keeping you up at night. Debt KO. Free, impartial advice on all your debt.